Hi everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Sit Down with Sancho. So today we're going to be interviewing Arja Barber. So Arja is a writer, she's a fashion consultant, her expertise is in race and intersectionality, um, feminism and how it relates with fashion. She focuses mainly on sustainable fashion and says whether you believe it or not, the two are actually incredibly connected. So today we're going to be talking about race, inclusivity, sustainable fashion, what the movement is doing right, what the movement is doing wrong and where it has to go. Um, we all know Aja from Instagram and from Patreon and I'm delighted to have her with me today. So let's get into it. Hello, Aja. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, it's Fashion Revolution Week, and for everyone who is self-isolating, as we all are, this is normally like our ethical and sustainable Christmas, and it's all gone away because of coronavirus. Obviously, so many industries are suffering, but for those of us in ethical and sustainable fashion, this is like our time to shine. Mm -hmm. So taking things online is such a, it's, I'm happy that we're doing it. And I think my greatest hope is that this will open up the conversation to people who normally wouldn't be able to go to the in-person event. Mm, absolutely. I think like, you know, I love the physical events, you know, we run clothes swaps and talks and they're great, but I'm always aware that the people who attend are the ones who have their evenings free or are local to our area. And I think when we're talking about inclusivity, we have to think about, well, how, how do we make information available to more people? So, yeah. Yes, really absolutely. One of the critiques that I've read over and over again is from people with disabilities saying that, like, this is the first time that I have felt included in some spaces. And maybe that's something that we need to really, really think about as we return to quote unquote, whatever normal is, you know, that we've been leaving out marginalized people because they can't participate in in-person events. And we need to just maybe do a better job all around. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for joining me. Have you had a busy week? What have you been up to? I have been busy. I've done lives with, um, bird song and I've watched a lot of lives because a lot of friends have been doing things. I'm going to do something with the new wardrobe. I've done something with Emperor's Claw. So yes, it has been a very, very busy week, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that people want to do lives with me and want to hear the things that I have to say. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think you do such a good job of breaking down such complex topics into the one-liner graphic posts on your feed and then of course you know your your actual comment goes into much further depth and opens up the conversation that um yeah like just hearing you break those down is just a real pleasure thank um, you so I think for me when I started doing this I realized that there was this weird gap in the market with people who understood sustainable and ethical fashion and people who had no idea but just wanted more information but they wanted it in layman's terms like the problem is within our circles so many people know this person and know that person we all speak to each other in these niche terms that we all understand you know but for an average consumer who might not have a lot of time to to put into this because they're stretched in other directions they want a place where they can actually learn about this stuff and they better, more informed decisions with their money. And there was really no place that was really doing that in a way that, you know, I, I thought about how could someone like my mom learn about this stuff, you mm. know? And does she? Mm, you know what, to be honest, like I learned from her, yeah. like my mom, and this is part of my platform is that sustainability is being used as a marketing tool, is being used to push more items, but it's one of those things where for marginalized brown and black people, sustainability has always been our way of life because of the lack of resources, because of the lack of access, because of the lack of um, privilege, extravagance, money, that sort of thing. Like there's nothing groundbreaking about reusing a container, okay? Mm -hmm. And like people, particularly ethnic people, know that like, I don't know about your family, but in my family, like we have a plastic container problem. Like you can't hold on to every plastic container, but yet that's how marginalized people live. And so the idea that online sustainability is packaged is like, 
this person is a sustainable influencer. They have all of these fancy bamboo containers, which they reuse to take their lunch in when like ethnic brown and black people and people within a certain poverty level would naturally reuse a container. You know, it's a conversation that we have to have because when it turns to only one person presenting the conversation, it's the same cycle of oppression all over again. I think one thing that always really, really shines out to me when people talk about reusing containers or, you know, bulk buying or repairing garments or anything like that is just as though they're new and innovative in and of themselves, um, is that they have just never lived elsewhere. Like they've yes. never been to a country and yes. in an environment, like, you know, in a neighborhood and just watched other people live their day-to-day lives. Absolutely. Yeah. And, like, and like stuff like even at the beginning of this pandemic, you know, like bulk buying, you know, people were like, oh, I can't find lentils, I can't find rice. And you know who <laughs> always has the lentils and the rice? The ethnic markets. Yeah. Because that's how ethnic people normally live, you know? So like, it's one of those things where concepts that aren't new in any way, shape or form are not just being presented, but they're being presented as this new narrative that's fairly whitewashed and that's so problematic. So do you think that there's a relationship between the sustainable like living movement and cultural appropriation? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Are you kidding? Like, like, like homesteading and like, farming and basically techniques that indigenous people have been using since the beginning of time are suddenly being presented as like new and cool and and lifestyle yes there is there is a there's a very clear line between the two things Mm. if you're not paying tribute to the people that you learn these things from then ultimately you're just co-opting absolutely absolutely and also it's like you know? And climate change is definitely intrinsically intrinsically linked to consumption, but the people that are doing consumption are being hit the hardest by climate change already. And those of us in the global north um, who are talking about climate change and how we have to save the world are not acknowledging that most of the resources and most of the cause of climate change are coming from here, you mm-hmm. know? Like we pretend like, oh, it's the whole world. But in actuality, there are countries where only a small portion of the population has been on an airplane, Mm. you know, but that's not the case in a lot of places. I mean, my grandmother in Alabama, who has, you know, lived, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, below middle class for a lot of her life has never been on an airplane, you know? So it's one of those things where people with the most privilege are like, leading the conversation and going oh but we're just trying to save the world and it's like you need to just save the world from yourself because yeah. like you're a part of this yeah. in a bigger way than the person who is marginalized and who lives in the global south basically yeah uh, yeah i think it's i don't know I, I do think there's a relationship between um the choices we make as consumers and the solution to climate change and yeah in virtue of having the most kind of disposable income, the people mm-hmm. who have the most disposable income can make those changes most significantly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So is, is there a problem with patting yourself on the back whilst you do so? Yeah, totally. I mean, honestly, like we shouldn't, we shouldn't need a cookie for some of this stuff, you know, but like, I, I totally, I, I write about privilege in my platform because like, we need to be thinking about that in all of our movements. I mean, okay, let's just, I I keep going back to the pandemic, but like I use um, Who Gives a Crap. They're a cool company and I know a lot of people use them. They're cool. They, they are, they do some social enterprising. They donate some of their proceeds to building toilets. That's great. Except we're forgetting to acknowledge that a family that is living paycheck to paycheck probably doesn't have an extra 30 pounds just to spend on toilet paper, Mm. you know? And so for me, I was fine at the beginning of the pandemic because I buy 48 rolls at once and then we stuff them under the bed or wherever we can put them in our small London flat. Mm. And I was great. And it would be very easy for me if I wasn't thinking about privilege to be like, (laughs) look at all those poor people fighting over toilet paper in the supermarket instead of acknowledging that the reason why I can participate in this system and support a company that's quite cool 
still comes down to the fact that I have 36 pounds, which I could spend on toilet paper or one go. It doesn't make me a better person. It means that I still have a certain amount of privilege to participate in something that is ultimately a cool way of doing things, but there are limitations to who can participate and who can't. Mm, absolutely I think also people take like a really strange pleasure in judging their peers and people that are inferior to them we all do I mean I I I can I will not sit here and be like oh I don't know I do but I'm working on it you know I'm a work in progress yeah I think like an example of that is people with gardens and space and green space at the moment watching others use public spaces and you know, I can't believe they're going to the park yeah yeah the reason why of course i do go to the park because we don't have like a private garden and so i do go to the park and i have to say if someone is complaining about the joggers i'm right there with you because they are not social distancing and they are breathing all over people and that is that is my one complaint about the park but otherwise like let people go to the park because not everyone in london has a garden if you have a garden in london you are extremely privileged Mm. So um, I think I think we've kind of skirted around a few things. Like one thing that I'd like to go back to is the idea of selling sustainability. Because I think um, H and M's declaration declaration that they are the most transparent brand is a perfect example of that. And you just recently wrote an Instagram post on that topic. Could you break that down? It is that is really 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 bad. Like it's one of those things where. Once again, why I do the work that I do is because average people who don't spend every waking minute of their life reading every sustainable document on the internet will not be able to decipher between what is greenwashing and what is not. And so the Transparency Index is a document that Fashion Revolution publishes every year where they get big brands to open up about what they're doing Transparency does not equal sustainability. And the reason why this is, is because all transparency is doing is saying, where are your factories? Who makes your clothes? That's it. That's it. It doesn't say these garment workers are being paid this amount and we can ensure that because we're there every single day and we monitor these factories constantly. Sustain it, it's, it does not equal sustainability. It does not equal transparency. All it means is that you have opened your books and said, this is where we manufacture, this is how we make our clothing. Mm. Now, H&M is by far one of the biggest greenwashing companies in the world, but they all are. Zara, same thing. The, the problem with the fast fashion business is the amount of product that's being produced and pushed every day can never be sustainable. So I broke it down on my grid post today, which I'll, I'm going to actually just open it up because I'm uh, there's a lot of numbers that you have to remember yeah. um, when it comes to this sort of stuff. But this is why H&M can never be a sustainable company in my book until they start talking about degrowth. They're too big. So H&M currently has 4,958 stores worldwide. Um, I've talked to a few people that used to work for the company. And I would say, I, I give this estimate, but it's a low estimate. Some stores sell upwards of 10,000 garments every single day, yeah. some stores. So if we are having that estimate and saying that if each store sells 5,000 garments a day at H&M, and I'm talking kids clothes, adult clothes, they, they sell everything under the sun. And for the big flagship stores, 10,000 products in a day is nothing. So if each store is selling 5,000 pieces daily, Daily, H&M is selling 25 million pieces of clothing yeah. daily. It gives that, it that number isn't sustainable because it, our world cannot sustain that. No. Our world is not an endless resource. The cotton that we wear in our dresses and jeans and every item that I own, I try and go for cotton because I love cotton. That cotton is grown and there is an environmental impact. And so when you have a company the size of H&M selling that amount of product every single day, that is not a sustainable system. Mm. So H&M has opened up to Fashion Rev and they have said, we're going to be transparent. So these are our factories and there are, you can look at the report, anyone can download it. 
but it doesn't measure anything in regards to sustainability because transparency is not sustainability and it is not ethics. Mm -hmm. It's transparency. So H&M happened to open the most amount of books and they were given the low bar trophy of most sustainable, but to be on the sustainability index, you have to sell a threshold of $400 billion worth of merchandise every single year. Yeah. So Which 400, that, like, do you, I think that was an interesting decision from um, fashion revolution to create that, that criteria. Cause of course it means very few brands can engage with very it. Very few brands can engage in that. And so, you know, there will never be a case where fashion revolution will have the bandwidth to review every single brand that exists on earth. And truth be told, small brands are not selling 400 billion worth of goods a, a year. Small brands sometimes aren't even selling $500,000 worth of goods a year. That is less than 1% of 400 billion, you know? So for the thousands of small brands out there that are completely transparent and utterly transparent because they're not manufacturing overseas and their supply chain isn't 50 people long, they're never going to be on the transparency index because there is no need because they are already transparent. And so for H&M to take their placing and determine that they are the most transparent brand in the world, that is a dishonest, bold-faced lie. That is um, co-opting what small brands are doing. You know, that is giving yourself a trophy that you are completely and utterly undeserving of. Yeah. They're lying. Yeah. They're not the most transparent brand in the world. There are brands that are small and will never be ranked on this list because they're transparent and there's no need to. Yeah. Um, so that's the first lie on their Instagram post. And then the second lie is that they have used the hashtag sustainability in the post, which transparency does not <sighs> equal sustainability. And so they have basically taken the fashion revolution transparency index and used it to greenwash and to, um, and to basically uh, convince people that they're being sustainable when in actuality that transparency index does not have anything to do with sustainability, but they're a notorious greenwasher. Okay. Their conscious collection, the government of Norway has, put them under scrutiny for that because they, they think that there's dishonesty there. Mm -hmm. And so when we have government saying you're, you're, we think you're lying to people about the sustainability behind what you're doing, mm -hmm. that's, that's cause for concern. So when you see a big brand taking something like a transparency index and then using hashtag sustainability, which that's going to pull up on the, um, hashtag, what is it, on the algorithm on Instagram. So that's going to be advertised to people. That's going to be pushed to people. They know what they're doing. They do. I think it's so important for customers, viewers, watchers, members of the public to understand that it's a tool being used by companies to reposition themselves to capture part of the sustainable clothing market. Yes. It's not accidental. It's not through lack of knowledge. It's not ignorance. It's a strategic move to reposition H&M in the, in the customer marketplace. And I think as more consumers, obviously more people are aware of the cost of fast fashion or fashion. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and they're trying to you know understand what responsibility they have and what that kind of labeling does is it tells the consumer yeah you're doing okay you you don't have to change like we don't we've changed yeah so so therefore you can continue to buy 20 garments a month from us that you don't actually really need and you don't even realize that we're actually pushing you to buy those garments because every time you enter our store our store is laid out in a way to encourage you to buy things that you might not need and i know because i was that consumer we all have fast fashion in our wardrobe i mean it was such a huge part of our culture for so long and there was a short amount of time where nobody really thought about the implications of this business model and so i never ever want to make it seem like people are bad people if you have fast fashion because that would be deeply hypocritical and also not helpful however we have to be aware that these companies are operating from a place of dishonesty ultimately mm, absolutely 
Um, and I think, I, th I hope that people now have the, like, the textbook definition of greenwashing. I hope that everyone understands very clearly that what H&M did on social media was declare that they were the most transparent and imply that they were mo the most sustainable brand in the world mm -hmm. um, when they weren't. And if anyone has any doubt of what it means to greenwash, I hope that that's a clear... Experience. That is a textbook definition of it because just the key takeaway is that the key takeaway is that if you're on the transparency index that your company already is probably a significant um, polluter in some ways because if you're selling 400 billion dollars worth of goods that is a lot of merchandise that's moving and so um, if you're a small brand, there's just no way that you'll even make it onto the index. And so there's thousands of brands out there. This is a sampling of probably, you know, less than, you know, 5% of the actual brands that exist on earth, you know, and there's so many good brands that are doing good things that they, they don't need this checks and balance system because that's in the core of their business. Mm H&M -hmm. is there because they need that checks and balance system because they have been, Question: They have been caught red-handed. They have been in a position where people question them with good reason and actual proof. And so for them to take this transparency index and make it appear like it's something it's not, that's a deeply problematic move. And that's ultimately one of the biggest greenwashes that I've seen in 2020. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for breaking that down, Raja. I, you know, once again, <laughs> I feel like you've just enlightened, you know, feel all the light bulbs shining. But at the end of the day, just remember a company that sells 25 million garments every single day isn't sustainable because that business model cannot sustain the earth in any way. That no. business model is hurting and harming resources. It's hurting and harming humans. It's drinking up water supplies in other countries so that we can have those cotton crops to make all of those t-shirts. Mm -hmm. And so there's just, our earth is under tremendous weight from some of the actions of a small group of humans and H&M is one of those groups. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm.